This is Denise Mendenhall. I'm going to go over the electrolyte sodium today and talking about what sodium does to our patients and how do we see it in our patients and how do we take care of it in our patients that we have. So we have to always think about our electrolytes and sodium is a big one about, we have to think about our fluid compartments. And the three fluid compartments in our body are vascular, interstitial, and cellular. And where we find the majority of sodium in these compartments are these two. The vascular interstitial is where we find the majority of sodium in our patient's body. And our serum levels that we will get in our labs show that it should be from 135 to 145. And if you compare that to all the other electrolytes, it is the largest range. And that's because sodium is the extracellular uh, electrolyte that we find in our patients, so it has the highest concentration. But sodium is a little bit different in that we have to think about sodium as a concentration, not as a number by itself. It's in a concentration with water. And so water and sodium have to be considered together because wherever sodium goes in outside of our cells when we get it into our body, it pulls with it passively water. And so water has to be considered part of this value. What we worry about when we're talking about sodium, sodium range, is when it starts to get outside of this range. And in order for you to get it outside of this range, you have to change the balance of this concentration. So in order for you to have an increase in sodium uh, in your value that would be above 145, you either have to have a decrease in water or you have to have something that increases sodium. Uh, examples of something that would decrease water in your patient's body might be dehydration. So a patient that becomes dehydrated, their sodium levels will artificially go uh, too high. And if you have uh, a patient, let's say, with a problem with the RAS system, RAS system is into sequestering sodium, and so that could potentially raise the concentration as well. On the other side of the picture, with sodium being too low, you either have an increased water that's diluting it, or you have a situation where you have a decrease in sodium. And things that may do that, increasing water, example would be SIADH, which you have an inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone, and that causes your kidneys to retain water, which can cause a too far dilution. On the other side, we could have a problem here with the RAS system, where we have a, or an anti, something that's against the RAS system, which would cause you to lose more sodium. An example, again, might be uh, some of the drugs and things that we use, so, or it could be, this is another disease called Addison's. We could have some problems with that as well. So we have to look at sodium as a ratio of water to sodium. And when you eat a big meal, somebody is, is eating a lot of sodium in their diet, they're not going to necessarily throw this out of balance because remember that sodium passively or water passively goes with sodium. So when patients have a problem with having too much sodium in their diet, they actually have a problem with volume, not necessarily changing the ratios here of your sodium. So let's talk about what the effects are on this patient's body when we're talking about sodium. All right, let's talk about what the effects are of sodium on the body when we're talking about it being hyper versus hyponatremia. And so when you have an increase in sodium, it could be for two reasons. You might have an increase in body fluids. Because you have an increase in sodium that may be pulling some water with it to increase that. And then if you have an increase in body fluid, you're going to see an increase in weight as well. And that's one of the ways we can measure that. If you start increasing sodium, it's going to cause increased water. It's going to affect the heart. The heart's going to have a harder time pumping because there's more fluid now in the extracellular, which is going to be your vasculature, which, uh, which plays into your heart. We also have to worry about the kidneys, and the kidneys can have to deal with that um, excess amount of fluid as well.
The other scenario with having too much sodium could be because you have an increase in sodium, but you may have a decrease in water, such as they're dehydrated. And in this case, you won't necessarily have that increase in weight, even though the sodium is higher. And that won't have as much of an effect here on the kidneys and the heart, as it will as on the brain. And we're worried about the brain with a hyper scenario, because what it does is it actually will suck water because the concentration is higher outside of the brain cells. It will suck water out of the cell and will actually dehydrate the brain cells. And there are symptoms that go with that dehydration effects on the brain. The brain can't tolerate that excess movement of water in and out and dehydration. So we have to be very, very careful when we're talking about the brain and sodium levels because of the effect of water within our cells, okay? Remember that we do have a sodium potassium pump on our cells and it does pump sodium out, but it doesn't have that water. And if the sodium is excess outside, it's going to affect that water concentration. On the other side, when we have hypo, we usually have a problem with increased water. And in this case, we may have a problem with fluid excess. And this fluid excess can act again on causing symptoms on the heart. It can also make it hard for the kidneys to have to deal with that excess fluid and water to try to get rid of. Again, depending on the cause. But the other effect has to do with the brain. Again, in this case, there's too much water out here, not enough sodium. It's going to pull sodium out of the brain and to deal with that concentration. It's going to push water into the brain to try to, to dilute it in that sense, and as a result, you overhydrate the brain because that water is free to flow between the two and it's not being kept out by sodium outside. So it really doesn't have much sodium inside the brain to go out, it's actually water going into the brain. And so we can expand the brain cells and that's not good for the brain as well. So we get symptoms depending on whether we are dehydrating or overhydrating the brain when it comes to sodium. Okay. All right, let's talk about what the effects are of sodium on the body when we're talking about it being hyper versus hyponatremia. And so when you have an increase in sodium, it could be for two reasons. You might have an increase in body fluids. Because you have an increase in sodium that may be pulling some water with it to increase that. And then if you have an increase in body fluid, you're going to see an increase in weight as well. And that's one of the ways we can measure that. If you start increasing sodium, it's gonna cause increased water. It's gonna affect the heart. The heart's gonna have a harder time pumping because there's more fluid now in the extracellular, which is gonna be your vasculature, which, uh, which plays into your heart. We also have to worry about the kidneys, and the kidneys can have to deal with that um, excess amount of fluid as well. The other scenario with having too much sodium could be because you have an increase in sodium, but you may have a decrease in water, such as they're dehydrated. And in this case, you won't necessarily have that increase in weight, even though the sodium is higher and that won't have as much of an effect here on the kidneys and the heart as it will as on the brain. And we're worried about the brain with a hyper scenario because what it does is it actually will suck water because the concentration is higher outside of the brain cells. It will suck water out of the cell and will actually dehydrate the brain cells. And there are symptoms that go with that dehydration effects on the brain. The brain can't tolerate that excess movement of water in and out and dehydration. So we have to be very, very careful when we're talking about the brain and sodium levels because of the effect of water within our cells, okay? Remember that we do have a sodium potassium pump on our cells and it does pump sodium out, but it doesn't have that water. And if the sodium is excess outside, it's going to affect that water concentration.
On the other side, when we have hypo, we usually have a problem with increased water. And in this case, we may have a problem with fluid excess. And this fluid excess can act again on causing symptoms on the heart. It can also make it hard for the kidneys to have to deal with that excess fluid and water to try to get rid of. Again, depending on the cause. But the other effect has to do with the brain. Again, in this case, there's too much water out here, not enough sodium. It's going to pull sodium out of the brain and to deal with that concentration. It's going to push water into the brain to try to, to dilute it in that sense. And as a result, you overhydrate the brain because that water is free to flow between the two and it's not being kept out by sodium outside. So it really doesn't have much sodium inside the brain to go out. It's actually water going into the brain. And so we can expand the brain cells and that's not good for the brain as well. So we get symptoms depending on whether we are dehydrating or overhydrating the brain when it comes to sodium. Alright, so we have patients with hypo and hypernatremia with too much sodium. So how do we take care and treat to bring them back into the 135 to 145 range? So we have to again go back to our dealing with water versus sodium and figure out how do we alter which one, how can we alter those to make this change and come back into normal range. So if we have hypo, we're too high of sodium, we either need to increase our water or we need to decrease our sodium. So ways that we will increase our water is that we will um, give IV fluids. That will help dilute. And we have to make sure that they don't have sodium in them. So we have to make sure that there are fluids that have like B5W. Um, and so we want to decrease. Sometimes we can put smaller amounts of sodium half normal saline, things that are diluted. So we want hypotonic solutions over here. And we want to correct slowly. And why do we want to correct slowly? Because if you remember, we have a brain that's been um, uh, dehydrated. And so we're trying to get that brain back to hydration and the cells, but you can't do it within a few hours because you could go just the opposite and overhydrate it. So we want to do it slowly. And they say to do it about over 48 hours to do it nice and slow. So sometimes using IV solution of half normal saline may do it slowly, but again, D5W, those that don't have saline then will also help. We just have to make sure that we go at a slower rate. To decrease sodium, we usually talk about a low sodium diet. And so we have to watch what our patients eat. We have to restrict it. Uh, we may get dietary involved. There are foods that have sodium more than other foods, and they have to cut down on those. Probably your, the ones, uh, the biggest culprit are your um, processed foods, processed meats, things that have um, uh, lots of sodium added into it as preservatives. So we have to watch out. It's better to go with kind of the whole grains, whole fruits, things that are more natural to get away from the sodium levels that we have. So that's to help try to treat your um, patients with your sodium being too high. Now, how do we help treat patients when their sodium is too low? In this case, we either have to decrease their water or we have to work on increasing their sodium. So to decrease their water, we're going to be putting them on fluid restrictions. And we're going to restrict those fluids so they don't overdo it on that. The other thing is, is that we've got an, a place in our body that can help us get rid of water. And that's going to be our kidneys. And so we might use diuretics. Probably the big one are your loop diuretics. Now you have to make sure, again, that you've got, you know, that it is a water problem that you aren't going to suddenly throw this person into some problems with water. But usually, again, this helps us to get the water concentration down. The other thing is, is that we might have to do on the other side is to increase sodium. It's kind of unusual um, for us to do this, but we might give them salt pills so they can get salt pills. Um, we can also do it by IV. 
And if we're talking about it being hypo, we could use our normal saline, which is our 0.9% sodium chloride. That would do it kind of slowly, again, kind of keeping in mind the slowness. Uh, we might take it a little bit slow here, too, in hydrating them. But we also have other concentrations that are steeper uh, amounts of sodium, 3% and 5%, that if we have to do it a little quicker, or we want to, again, not overdo fluids, Sometimes there's a lot more fluid in this 0.9 than there is in 5%. So we might be able to cut down the amount of fluids we have to give them in order to correct it. But these are solutions that can be used to overcome a patient. And then don't forget that we also can include a diet that has some higher sodium in it. And this is the case to increase sodium. So these are the ways that we try to treat patients that have sodium issues. We have to deal with the concentration and altering that concentration and these are the variety of ways we do it. You do have a sheet in your Blackboard that is about electrolytes. It does provide many of the signs and symptoms and other issues we talked about. Please include uh, and look at that for uh, adding the treatment section. And that draws our conclusion about sodium electrolytes. Hi, I'm going to be talking about potassium electrolyte today in our patient's body. And again, like we talked about with sodium, I want to refer to the compartments in your body of fluids. We have vascular, interstitial, and cellular. And where we find majority of potassium in these compartments is actually cellular. We actually have a high concentration of potassium in our cells as compared to outside of our cells. And as a result, the lab that we have, that we get from our vasculature serum, shows that our normal ranges for potassium are 3.5 to 5.0. That is much lower than sodium, which has a high concentration out in the extracellular area. And so as a result, it takes very little potassium outside of the body to do the big job that it does uh, outside. The majority, as I said, are inside of our cells. And the reason it is is because we have that sodium-potassium pump where we pump sodium out of our cells while we take in potassium inside of our cells. And if we were to put a probe inside of a single cell, we would probably find a pretty high concentration of potassium, just like we find a high concentration of sodium out in our vasculature. So potassium is very high here, very low over here, but has an extremely a delicate level change here, but being this low, it really uh, doesn't take much to change potassium levels as compared to sodium. Sodium is like it's in an ocean. This is like it's in a small, this is a small swimming pool. And so we have to be very careful about changes in potassium because a little bit can go a long ways in our extracellular area. One other thing to note is that because our cells pump out sodium, um, there's nothing else that is comparable for our cells that could be exchanged for potassium. So sometimes, we'll, and we'll talk about this later, hydrogen can sometimes be exchanged with potassium when it comes to the cells. Now, how do we regulate potassium outside in this area? Because it's very important that we consider how, how do we keep the levels that we need to. And the big organ that does that is our kidneys. Now, does our kidneys have anything that directly affects them with potassium levels? No, it does it indirectly. And that is with the RAS system. Remember that the RAS system is about holding sodium into the body. So as sodium is retained, in exchange for sodium, potassium is lost. And so um, we have to think about how does our kidneys deal with potassium? It does it indirectly. Now, can the kidneys shut off the flow of potassium and keep it in if it needs to? And the answer is no. It can actually slow down the loss of potassium by letting go of some sodium with the RAS system uh, slowing down but it can't stop the last loss of potassium. So it's a very, very important concept. Our patients won't stop losing potassium. As a result, in order for us to maintain our balance, 
we have to make sure that we have a good intake of potassium to keep up with our loss of potassium that's happening with our kidneys. And you'll find, if, if you look in your dietary book, that a majority, if not all the food groups, have potassium in them. Because it's found inside of cells, it's found inside of meat, you have it in, in milks, um, even some uh, of your vegetables and your uh, fruits, because it's in the soil. It's all part of much, much of our um, um, food intake products. So it's very important that our patients eat. And again, there are some foods that have more than others in it. But that is how we regulate potassium in our bodies. We're going to move on to talking about hyper and hypokalemia. All right, we're talking about potassium, and we're moving on to talk about the mechanisms of what will cause hypokalemia, greater less than 3.5, or hyperkalemia, which is greater than 5.0. So let's talk about hypo. What could cause us to have too little potassium in our bloodstream? And one of the ways is to not eat it. As we mentioned before, that everything, all foods have got a certain amount of potassium in them. So by not eating, you're not replenishing what you're losing from your kidneys. So starvation is one way to do it. Kind of similar to that is say you do eat, but it moves through your GI system too quickly in the form of diarrhea. And that will also cause you to lose potassium out of your body before it has a chance to be absorbed by your vasculature to be available for uh, the vasculature. And then remember that we have potassium inside of our cells, of our body. And so we have to think about, this is where the majority of potassium is. So what may cause you to have too low potassium? Well, it's possible to pack more potassium inside of your cells. But in order for your cells to want to do that, something has to be different out here in the environment. And one of the things that we can do is have an alkalotic patient that has alkalosis out here. What does alkalosis do? It's base, so it wants to pull hydrogen to balance it out so it's not so acidotic. And where does it get the hydrogen is from inside the cells. So if hydrogen is pulled out of the cells, something has to replace it, and what can replace it is potassium and that can lower the potassium level outside of the bloodstream. Another thing that can cause your cells to sequester more potassium is to grow a bunch of more new cells. And if you have more tissue repair that's faster than expected, you can have a lot more potassium sequestered into those new cells, and that may also lower your bloodstream amount of potassium. And then the last thing to consider with hypo is your kidneys. This is usually a big culprit of potassium levels going low because you can lose a lot more this way and a lot more quickly than you sometimes think about or, or expect because we do a lot with our kidneys in the clinical area. One of the big drugs that is used are your diuretics, especially loop. Loop diuretics, they will uh, definitely lose potassium out of you. Um, we also give our patients many times IV fluids for various um, conditions. And IV fluids, if they don't have much of any potassium in them, will uh, dilute and also bring down your potassium level. And then another way can be sometimes uh, the drugs that we give that stimulate or sequester sodium in exchange for potassium. And steroids are a good example of drugs that will keep sodium and boost potassium, and that may change your amounts that you have in your bloodstream. So the kidneys are a big deal when it comes to hypo or losing potassium because they're common, commonly using potassium all the time. The next scenario is what about a patient that's hyperkalemic? What changes in this picture when we're talking about hyperkalemic? And why do they have it? So in this case, you would have a patient that might have an excess increase in their diet. Now, it's kind of hard to do because even if we do eat more in our diet, usually our kidneys can kind of help you know, get rid of that. But it's possible. Or we're giving a lot of potassium pills 
in our clinical area thinking that we have someone with low potassium and we didn't check and now the potassium is high and we give them more pills. And that's another way to bring it up. And then a third way might be kind of like we talked about with sodium, and that is if we decrease the water, they become dehydrated uh, and, and we have problems with uh, balance in, in water. Sometimes that can change our potassium and make it high, artificially high. So um, GI-wise, we don't usually have a problem with that. The um, cells on the other side, instead of having problems with alkali, if we have an acidotic patient with acidosis going on, that will push hydrogen in to the cells while pulling potassium out, and that might raise our potassium levels out in our periphery. Another issue would be tissue injury. If we kill some cells, they get injured, and a bunch of them get um, uh, killed so that they are lysed and opened up and they release that potassium, then if you have too many of those, that can raise the amount that's in your bloodstream. And then finally, when we're talking about the kidneys, the way to bring potassium too high into your levels is to have, you should say, renal failure. For the kidneys to shut down and not work would be a definite way to bring your potassium level up in the bloodstream. Um, another, when we talk about drugs, we have potassium sparing drugs that can also raise up your potassium levels. Uh, usually not a whole lot, but if you use them excessively, it's a possibility that it might. So shutting down the kidneys, uh, changing the conditions of your cells, and doing anything with your intake, your GI tract, those are ways that we influence the levels of potassium in your bloodstream. We're going to move on and talk a little about the purpose of potassium now, what it will do to the patient's symptoms. So now we're talking about potassium and what the purpose is. Why do we need potassium outside of our cells in our, in our vascular system, uh, in our interstitial area? What purpose does potassium have that makes it so important? And you have to go back to your physiology and remember that our nerve cells, when they deal with the exchange of your sodium potassium between the nerves, it actually sets up your electrical impulse that gets read by your muscles. And so potassium is very, very important for nerve conduction with information to tell your muscles what to do. And it's your muscles where we start to see the signs and symptoms of problems with uh, having a lack of or change in your potassium levels. And this, uh, the muscles that we are most concerned about happen to be your heart. They also are your skeletal. They are also your GI. And then they also are your respiratory muscles. And so when we talk about symptoms of hyper or hypokalemia, we are talking about seeing symptomatic changes in the muscles that work these particular types of areas. So when we talk about having too low of potassium, hypo, we're gonna see slowing down of this conduction. So we'll see these muscles slowing down and not functioning as well. We can actually see on an EKG, you remember you have a P wave, and then you have a QRS, and then you have a T wave. When it's too low, you have an inverted T. And then on the other side, when you have too high a potassium, you're gonna be seeing an EKG with P, QRS, and then the T actually peaks up instead. So it goes the opposite. So with low potassium, things slow down. So we get a slowdown. When we get to high potassium, we get hyperactivity. And so we can see problems with these muscles also doing too much or going too, um, too high uh, and hyper where they shouldn't be acting. And so these are how we see the symptoms. It's all based back to the nerve and nerve conduction and the effect that potassium has. Last, we're gonna move on and talk about how to treat potassium issues. Now we're going to talk about how do you treat hypo or hypokalemia 
and what are the steps and, and, and thought processes that go into treatments of it. So let's talk about a hypokalemic scenario where you have too low potassium. Very, very important to get that up. It can be done orally. And as we talked about, we had foods that have potassium in, but again, we don't know how much potassium is in each food. So more likely, we're going to give the patient pills with certain milliequivalents of potassium. And again, the most common is 10 to 20 uh, milliequivalents orally. You might have to take several of that throughout the day to get that to come back up. If a patient is extremely low, we're usually talking about um, it being below 3.0, uh, we want to get it up faster than waiting for pills and digestion, we're going to be giving it IV. And it's very important that you know the concentrations of potassium. The majority of potassium that you'll see, if you were to go into a staff um, uh, medication room and pull out an IV, it's probably going to have that 20 mil equivalents added to it when it has potassium in it. And this is a standard amount that's very common, but the reason being that this 20 mil equivalents, if you give it IV, it approximates what is lost by the kidneys. So I refer to this as a maintenance dose of potassium, and you can't overdo, you can't give them too much potassium with this. As long as you have a patient with a normal functioning kidney, 20 mil equivalents will maintain their levels in the bloodstream. So this is not to correct it. This is just to keep it maintained. If you remember, if a patient's NPO, which we often do in the clinical area, they're not getting the food, we have to make sure that they often get the potassium. And so we often put IVs with 10 to 20 mil equivalents up for them to have. And so uh, this is safe to give. That's why they stock it up in the rooms. Anything higher than this though, which can be anywhere from 30 to 40, we could do 60, we could do 80 mil equivalents, is to correct and to bring up somebody's potassium levels. So these have to be specially formulated and made. They're usually not stocked on the units because we don't want to incorrectly grab the wrong solution and possibly elevate somebody's potassium. So these are done and ordered. But one of the things to remember when you are giving potassium IV that's in these larger doses to correct it, you want to make sure that you don't give it too fast. But again, we have to correct this potassium uh, levels in a rapid enough uh, way that the patient's not going to suffer for it. So they tell us that we should to go no more than 10 mil equivalents per hour IV without having a monitor. If we have to go faster, we would need an EKG monitor to make sure that we aren't overcorrecting it and going the other direction. But if we're not monitoring or we have a patient that needs it uh, quickly, IV, this is the standard med surge unit rate that we run it at. And if, so if you have a 60 mil equivalent dosage of your IV, you're gonna be running that over six hours. If it's 40 mil equivalents, you're gonna run it over four hours. And that's what you should expect to do when we're giving IV amounts of corrective solutions of potassium. Okay, we don't have really any way that we correct uh, potassium in relationship to our cells. The other thing, other way is to think about the kidneys and losing it. And we might, if the patient needs to have diuretics, we would want to use a potassium sparing diuretics. So if we need to get fluid off, that would be the suggestion here. But mostly when we have hypokalemic, we're going to be correcting it either by intake of food and pills. And again, we tend to do it um, at, at uh, mill equivalents of, excuse me, 10 to 20. And usually we're talking about a potassium level about 3.0 to 3.5. We're correcting it orally with pills. When it starts to get to below 3.0, so less than 3.0, we're going to correct an IV and get it done quicker. All right, so that's hypo. Let's talk about hyper, having too high of potassium. How are we going to correct for that? Well, we can try to decrease it with a diet, having a, a low diet of potassium. And again, many times that's not a very appealing diet. It has less of your um, 
fruits and vegetables and, and, and good kinds of wholesome things, but some of your more refined foods. But anyway, we don't usually rely on that as being the way to do that. Another way that we can deal with it from the food aspect is the GI tract. We do know we can lose it through the GI tract if we have diarrhea. So there is a drug called KX Alate. KX Alate. It's a liquid uh, medication the patient can take. And it will actually draw potassium out of the bloodstream, kind of into the GI tract. And actually, in exchange for sodium and calcium, you have to be careful about that because it, it could raise uh, a patient's bloodstream of sodium or calcium. Uh, a little bit, but it's going to pull the, the potassium out and then the patient is going to have diarrhea or they're going to lose it th via the, the GI tract. So kx is a drug to help pull it out. Uh, another way is to look at our cells. And I'll put a big cell over here and draw a picture of that. And if you remember, we talked about we have potassium in here. We've got hydrogen. And so if we need to quickly get rid of the potassium in the bloodstream, sometimes we can hide it temporarily inside of our cells. And there's a way to do that treatment-wise. And so what we will do is we will make, we want to put potassium from outside here inside of the cell. So we have to draw the hydrogen out of the cell. And the thing that's going to draw it is to make it more alkalotic out here. Alkalot. And so we're going to do usually bicarb. We can put bicarb in an IV and we can actually make the patient more alkalotic and it's going to cause potassium to go into the cells because it's pulling hydrogen out. Another thing that will help potassium better get inside of that cell is actually insulin. Insulin will help that process of pulling the potassium inside of the cell. And we have to be careful, this isn't just for diabetic patients. We can give insulin with bicarb to a patient, and if we give the patient uh, half that, we have to make sure that they also get some uh, dextrose. That they get some sort of glucose with that insulin, because we don't want to drop their sugars out abnormally. And so temporarily, with this process of giving bicarb, IV and making sure they get some insulin with some sugar water, um, IV, we can actually temporarily cause the potassium levels to go down. Now we have to think about correcting whatever the problem is that's causing that eventually, but that's a temporary way. And then the last way that we can talk about losing or getting rid of potassium is definitely our kidneys. And probably the biggest drug for doing that is going to be our Lasix. Our Lasix is our loop diuretic. It's going to be the most best uh, drug for getting rid of potassium levels. Unfortunately, if you have a patient with kidney failure, then we're talking about this not necessarily working on their kidneys. If they have a problem with kidney failure, the last resort is your hemodialysis. And that is, when we have patients with kidney failure, is really the only way that they can bring their potassium levels down. Because we can't get them to quit eating. They have to eat, so they're going to be getting potassium all the time. And then we have to make sure that they get their um, potassium taken off with dialysis. And that is it in a nutshell of how we treat patients with potassium levels high or too low. We are going to be talking about calcium, the electrolyte in your bloodstream that we are concerned about today. And let's talk about the physiology and the mechanisms involved with calcium and the levels that are in your bloodstream. First off, we find the majority of our calcium, 99%, is in your bones. And so it is the largest um, uh, electrolyte that we find in your bone system. But the 1% that we have is in your bloodstream. And it's a delicate balance. The normal range for it is the 8.5 to 10.5 in your bloodstream. And it's regulated by two hormone balancing processes. So it's always has a balance to try to keep it in that 8.5 to 10.5 range. The first is your parathyroid. 
your parathyroid has a hormone, parathyroid hormone. That hormone is secreted when you need to increase your calcium in your bloodstream. So it is going to help to increase calcium in the blood. And how does it do that, this hormone? It goes to the bone and says, please help, we need some calcium back in. It can release a little bit to help with that. The other way it helps is that when you eat food, you have calcium in many of your foods, especially your dairy products, in your um, uh, fish and items that have, especially if they have bones or they're from the sea, uh, you find it in some of your green leafy vegetables and a few other things. So you get it in your food. I don't know if it's unfortunate, but 80% of what you take in is lost in your feces. It's the 20% approximately that is absorbed into your bloodstream. And the hormone that helps with this absorption is your vitamin D. And where do we get vitamin D? If you remember, it comes from your skin with sunshine, helping to form that. And it's also formed by your kidneys and helping to get that. So with the parathyroid stimulation, Vitamin D helping you get some of the absorption also from your foods, okay? So this is all for the purpose of increasing calcium in your blood. What happens when you get too much calcium in your blood? You need to uh, get it lowered. And so your thyroid gives off the calcitonin. And your calcitonin is your other hormone on the other side that's going to work to decrease calcium in your blood. And it does so by kind of reversing the process. It causes the calcium to go back into your bone. It will kind of decrease the need for the absorption and may also communicate to the kidneys, we can lose a little bit here. And so that way brings that calcium level back down into our normal level. So that's how we keep a balance in your calcium levels in your body. So let's talk about that 1% that is in your bloodstream. Very, very important to understand that calcium has two forms or ways that it is transported in your bloodstream. First way is that it is bounded. And what is it bounded to? It is bounded to albumin. Okay? The second way it's transported in the bloodstream is what we call ionized. Ionized is the free floating available for use, and this is the one that we are concerned most about because this is what provides the functioning that calcium has within our bloodstream to the various organs that it works with. Okay, so let's talk about that 1%. And of that 1%, 50% of that is bound to the albumin, and 50% is bound or is free and ionized. And so when you get the calcium level on your chemistry uh, in the lab, in the um, hospital, it doesn't separate the two. It's possible the doctor could order a separate lab of ionized, but that's very rare and, and oftentimes uh, they don't need to on adults. But again, our goal is to get the, um, excuse me there, is to get the 8.5 to 10.5 range. Unfortunately, if you have a problem with your albumin levels, it can change what your level in the entirety is going to be when it comes out on your patient's lab. And so we need a way to figure out when we have a person that has a change in their albumin, and most likely lowering of their albumin, what does that do and how do we know that we have enough ionized to do the work that calcium has? And there is a relationship between albumin and the amount of calcium that's found in your bloodstream. 
And the formula is for every 1.0 drop in albumin, there is an approximate drop of 0 0.8 of calcium. So it's almost a one-to-one -one relationship, but not quite. So let's talk about what this means. Let's say that we have a patient that has an, an albumin of, let's put it 2.5 for our patient. And let's say that they have a calcium of 7.5. And our question is, with the 7.8, do we have a patient who is abnormally low? And again, our question is, is, are we dipping into the ionized? Or is this level because the boundedness has gone down, which is okay. It's not a harm to the patient. So we have to use our formula to figure this out. What are we looking at in relationship to this calcium and this albumin level. And if you remember correctly, up here, we have a one point drop to 0.8, okay? And we have up here, let's say 2.5. So our normal albumin is 3.5 to 5.0. Now some say to take it at a four, but I'm going to take it at the drop from the low one, the 3.5. So that is actually a drop of one. And having dropped down here, 2.5 from 3.5 is one. So that means we have an approximate 0 0.8 drop in our calcium. Well, what do we do with this 0 0.8? If you take your normal range, 8.5 to 10.5, excuse me there, and we minus 0 0.8, we come up with 7.7 to 9.7. This 7.7 to 9.7 is now our new range of calcium normal for a albumin of 2.5. So the 7.8 is now considered to be normal for this level of albumin. And as a result, we know that the patient is safe with their ionized amount. It's the bounded that was lost. And we don't look at this as being abnormal for this patient in this scenario. All right, so we talked about bounded and ionized. And why is ionized so important? Well, you have to understand or remember what the job is of calcium. And the job of calcium has to do with your muscles. So to get your muscles to move back and forth, they need to have calcium. And so calcium is important, and you'll see on your patients that have abnormal calcium, it is affecting muscle movement. And when you have too little of calcium, you will not have the muscles being able to move. They actually become Paralyzed. So if you want to think of it that way, they become, in a sense, paralyzed. Uh, and we have to worry about certain muscles in your body that have movement and need to move. Besides your skeletal muscles, which can uh, be affected, we also are worried about your respiratory system and your muscles to breathe. We are also concerned about your heart and your heart being able to beat. And so these are very, very important um, considerations when calcium levels get too low. On the other hand, when calcium levels get too high, it doesn't make you hyper or anything. It actually, it's like it slows everything down. It makes it too sluggish. It's too full. It's too much for it. So everything becomes weaker. It weakens the uh, muscles and so they don't move as well and then you also are concerned about not only your skeletal muscles but your heart and your respiratory system breathing and all so that's the problems with ionized getting out of balance in our patients talk about how we treat someone with hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia and in order to talk about 
the too high or too low levels of calcium, we need to go back to our balance system that we talked about earlier. And we're going to be manipulating this balance based on what the need is in our bloodstream to keep our calcium between 8.5 and 10.5. So let's first talk about hypocalcemia, too low of calcium. How can we get their calcium back up? Well, let's talk about first, we could increase their food intake of calcium in the dairy products and other types of foods. But again, that's kind of hard to bring up somebody's calcium level just by food. So most of the time, we need to add the supplement pills of calcium that the doctor can order on top of that to help try to increase uh, the availability of uh, calcium in our gut to get into our bloodstream. If we need to elevate our bloodstream amount quicker than waiting for the GI tract, we can give an IV of calcium and the form that we use is calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate is the drug of choice. It's a very potent drug. We have to be careful with it. It can be given in an emergency situation if the calcium is so low that our heart is stopped. And asystole is a commonly used emergency drug for restarting the heart. In this case, we're hoping to use it to start elevation of a lower calcium level and bring it up at the correct amount in, in the right rate. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not overdoing it. It's possible if you give it too fast and a patient is on digitalis that we might elevate their, um, their dig and dig toxicity can occur. So we want to be careful about that, make sure that we give it at the correct rate. The other thing to consider with too low calcium is again uh, the tetany, um, or excuse me, the, the, yeah, the tetany, the paralysis that was going on. And we want to make sure not only their heart is working, but the respiratory system. So you might have to have a trach starter kit at bedside in case the doctor needs to do an emergency tracheostomy on the patient and get them on a respirator until we can get their calcium levels back up into the normal range and level. So those are the ways we help bring calcium levels back up when we need to. Let's talk about too low, or excuse me, too high of calcium, the opposite of too low. So it's very rare to find a patient that has too high calcium. Many times they have some sort of a, a bone metastases, uh, cancer in the bone or something that would cause you to have too elevated, among other things. But let's look at what we can do to manipulate this to bring calcium levels down. Of course, we could have a decrease of food intake, but that's usually as, not as much as the culprit. But uh, we want to try to stop uh, or decrease the absorption of the GI tract. So one of the things is we can give steroids. Steroids actually compete with vitamin D uh, in the gut and that will help to decrease the absorption that way. Another way is to IV, put it over the kidneys, normal saline, and we're going to flush some calcium out through the urinary tract. We do lose a little bit of calcium through there. We have to be concerned when we're increasing amounts of calcium through the uh, urinary tract that we could run into the uh, problem of kidney stones. Very commonly stones are made of calcium as the um, uh, substrate to the uh, stones. So we have to be careful about that, but it is one of the ways to help bring it down in the bloodstream. Another way to help bring it down in the bloodstream is to use our calcitonin. We do have it manufactured as a drug and can be given to help lower the calcium by depositing it into our bone. Another way to help with bone and bone deposit is to use phosphorus. And phosphorus, if you remember, is in an inverse relationship with calcium. So as calcium goes up, phosphorus goes down. As phosphorus goes up, calcium goes down. And we can manipulate calcium, uh, at least temporarily, by using some phosphorus. And the drug of choice would be sodium or potassium phosphate. Okay? 
So that can be given IV to our patients to help temporarily bring down that levels of calcium. Another way is to remove the parathyroids, if that seems to be the culprit of why. So if somebody has a parathyroid uh, problem, hyperparathyroidism, that's the solution is to get rid of those little parathyroids um, surgery. And then another way to consider keeping it within your bones is to get your patient up and ambulating. Remember that weight bearing does increase the deposit of calcium into your bone to strengthen your bones. And that's another way that we can help our patients with hypercalcemia. So those are the ways that we manipulate calcium to bring the levels down for our patients. Now we're going to talk about phosphorus and how is phosphorus regulated in our body and how do we take care of abnormal phosphorus levels in our bloodstream. So let's talk a little about phosphorus and how it is managed in your body. And first of all, we have 85% of our phosphorus is within our bone and bone structure. The other place that it's secondly commonly found is in our cells. We have 14% of our phosphorus is found inside our cells. And then the 1% that's left is what we find in our extracellular, and that's what influences our bloodstream, and our bloodstream amounts. So our normal range for phosphorus is our 2.5 to 4.5 approximately. And again, it is low uh, in that because of the, the uh, low amount that's available to be in our bloodstream. But that's what we have to regulate and keep phosphorus at. So how do we keep phosphorus elevated or keep this levels? Well, we do eat food that has phosphorus in it. Lots of phosphorus, lots of foods have phosphorus in it. Um, how else do we regulate it? We can regulate it via our calcium. Uh, re in, again, it's, um, it's the opposite, it's, it's inversely. So it's the inverse with calcium and phosphorus. So as we regulate calcium, as we talked about before with our parathyroid and balances of calcitonin, when that gets uh, changed, it also changes our phosphorus levels. And then we also need to think about the kidneys. The kidneys have a little bit of regulation in that we can excrete certain amounts of phosphorus as needed as well with our patients. Now, why do we need uh, phosphorus? What's the purpose in this 1%? And also kind of feeds into cellular is that if you remember correctly about our energy source, our energy source for our body is ATP. The P stands for phosphorus. Adeno tri Phosphate. And so the thing that I remember with phosphate is that it is helpful for the energy levels in your body. And the three areas that phosphorus energy is important for is in your food metabolism. So it helps with metabolism of protein, fats, carbohydrates. It helps also with muscles and nerves. So muscles and nerves need that energy. And so when you have problems with phosphorus, you'll see changes with that. And then the last thing it does help is with your RBCs formation and, and health of, of your levels of RBCs and also with the regulation of, of RBCs with the oxygen level. So that has a lot to do with energy. So the problems we see in our patients have to do with the levels of ATP or energy. Now let's talk about phosphorus and what may cause you to have an imbalance in your phosphorus levels. So let's first talk about hypophosphatemia and what may cause that. First off, since the majority of our food has phosphorus in it, if you were to decrease your phosphorus intake in malnutrition, 
that can cause you to have low phosphorus in your bloodstream. Another way is to uh, make it leave the GI tract abnormally. And alcoholics have a tendency to lose phosphorus out of their GI tract before it can be absorbed. Also, the overuse of antacids. There are certain antacids that are binding to phosphorus, and that can also make it leave the GI tract before it's absorbed. Another way for you to have low phosphorus is to hide it within your cells because they can handle a certain amount. There's a certain amount of phosphorus in your cells. And one of the ways that that can be done is alkalosis. So having an alkalotic situation may also sequester it in there. And then the other way is your kidneys. Your kidneys have a certain amount. They also lose over time, which is a part of regulation. But if you have too much loss with diuretics, you can have a problem with having too low phosphorus in your bloodstream. Or if you have a patient that has a hyperglycemic condition where they have an increase in their glucose in their bloodstream, it spills over to the kidneys and pulls water and it can pull phosphorus out as well. So either way, it can be lost via the kidneys too quickly and lower it in your bloodstream. So those are the possible ways to have too low of phosphorus in your bloodstream. Now let's look at the ways that you could have possibly increase of phosphorus in your bloodstream. And let's go back to the kidneys and look at that. And if you have kidney failure, you will definitely be holding on to your phosphorus and not losing it. And that's a very common problem with our patients that have renal failure is that their phosphorus levels get too high in them. Another way is to get phosphorus out of our cells. And an acidosis condition will pull that out. So will sepsis. And then the third way is if we have destruction of our cells. If you destroy cells, that releases that, that uh, phosphorus out into the bloodstream. And that would be with patients who have trauma to their cells and cell breakdown. And so these are ways that we can elevate that. And then the last way that phosphorus can be brought up is to have a uh, imbalance uh, disruption of your calcium levels. And so we tend to see when calcium gets out of balance, for example, with hyper thyroidism or with hypoparathyroidism. So even though these may raise calcium levels, that's a disruption and it will throw the phosphorus off and it will also elevate you know, the patient's bloodstream. And why do we worry about phosphorus as remember, ATP is where phosphorus does its work in the body, and it works on uh, various uh, cells and components of functioning in our body. So we're going to see changes in our patients uh, when we have phosphorus changes. We're talking about problems with our central nervous system. We're going to have problems with our heart, and our heart being able to, to uh, beat correctly. We're going to have problems with our GI tract. We're going to have problems with our muscles in general. We're going to have problems with our red blood cells and them not being able to release the oxygen, which is important as the other component to make ADP uh, in our processes. Um, and uh, again, our nerves kind of also need that process going. So all of these will become weakened when we have problems with our phosphorus levels. So how do we treat patients that have too high or too low of phosphorus? Let's talk about having too low of phosphorus. And most of the time it's because of malnutrition. So let's work on increasing our food intake. If we can get that person out of malnutrition, that will help. We can also give supplements. We can give 
of either sodium or potassium phosphate. So we can give that orally. We can also give this in an IV of sodium or potassium phosphate. And it's very important that we give it in TPN if the patient is getting total parental nutrition. Phosphorus definitely needs to be a part of the electrolytes. In fact, all the electrolytes need to be included in certain amounts within TPN, but it's very important that phosphorus is because we need that phosphorus for the energy levels that a patient needs for all the healing processes they have. So that's how to increase phosphorus when we have patients with lack of it. Now let's talk about if we have too high of phosphorus. Well, the important thing about that is we've got to fix what caused it in the first place. So if we have a problem with our calcium balance and what's causing it, we have to fix that. If we have a patient that has it because of kidney failure, the fix for that, if we can fix a failure, that's great, but sometimes we can't, they have to go to dialysis. So kidney dialysis may be the treatment for a patient that has kidney failure, and that's part of the processes to remove off excessive amounts of phosphorus. And then another way via our kidneys is to work on flushing it out. So we can flush it out. And we can use diuretics, but we can also if we use some normal saline IV, that IV can help to flush it out. And we can increase fluids orally. Or IV, again, we talked about doing an IV, we can have them drink more. And so by doing those kinds of things, we can help bring down phosphorus levels that have gotten dangerously high. Today we're going to talk about the electrolyte of magnesium. Magnesium is our fifth electrolyte for the series. And we do find magnesium in your bones, as well as your cells in your body. We only find about 1% in your extracellular area. And that 1%, the range in your serum is 1.6 to 2.6. So what magnesium is important for in cells, we have it for enzyme, enzyme uh, production and, and usage. We also have it for protein and DNA processes or synthesis. inside of our cells, but for this that's out here in our extracellular, it has another role, extracellular, and it has to do with our nervous system and its connection to muscles via the nerves, and we have a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, which does transmit the nerve telling the muscle to contract, and magnesium acts as a sedative. So magnesium is a sedative effect on this acetylcholine so that the muscle does not get as excited as it could if it was left by itself. So it makes sense when we're talking about patients that have low magnesium, their symptoms that we're going to see are going to be musculoskeletal neural reactions. So with low magnesium, we're going to see an excited neuromuscular reaction. And with too much magnesium, an increase in magnesium, we're going to see so sedated that we might see um, stoppage of muscles movements. And the biggest concern would be your heart and would be your respiratory system. So we do worry about magnesium in relationship to this effect it has at 1% extracellular that we find in our serum uh, blood is what we're concerned about. So what would cause us to have too low of magnesium? Well, we get our magnesium from foods. 
And we have a variety of foods that have magnesium in it. We have nuts, green vegetables, and nuts, and meat, and seafood, even chocolate has that little magnesium in it, as well as your grains. So you can see that we have quite a few foods that have it in there. But if we don't eat enough, if we have malnutrition, we'll have potentially low magnesium. Another way that we could have low magnesium is to lose it through the GI tract. And so we could lose it with diarrhea. We also have problems with absorptions with alcoholics. They also seem to have a, um, often uh, an effect of low magnesium from uh, how poorly they eat, and that kind of contributes a little bit to their tremors and DD, DD, um, their tremors and their um, DTs that they have when they're trying to withdraw. So that's a part of the scenario that we have to think about with our alcoholics. And then we also can have a problem with the kidneys losing because, again, our electrolytes are controlled in ways by our kidneys and whether our kidneys are excreting a lot or little. So if we have a lot of diuretics or if we have um, some medications that uh, induce this, uh, besides diuretics, we have um, aminoglycosides. Are kind of notorious for having an effect with the kidneys to kind of lose magnesium a little bit more. So those are the basic ways that we tend to uh, have problems with not enough or too little of magnesium. Now let's move on and talk about what would cause us to have too much magnesium in our system. And of course the big one would be renal failure. So if we aren't putting anything out, we always have to put out a little bit. If we're always taking magnesium in, we always have to put some out. So if it fails, of course we're going to be keeping that in. There's also some drugs that have magnesium added to them. They're often antacids. and some laxatives that have magnesium added to it, and we need to be careful about those drugs too if we have a patient, especially if they have uh, renal failure on top of that. So these are the main ways that we will have changes in magnesium levels. Again, we have a good source of getting magnesium into our body, but we have potentials that we might be losing or gaining magnesium in certain scenarios. And on. And so how do we treat a patient with problems with magnesium levels? So if we have a patient who is too low from the 1.6 to 2.6, they're below that 1.6, how do we get their levels back up? Well, we talked about that there's a lot of foods that have magnesium in it, and they often don't eat well when they're low. So we want to make sure that we get rid of the malnutrition and we make sure that they get the foods that have magnesium in them. If they need help with that, we can also give pills. So supplements with pills with magnesium in it and make sure that they get those pills as supplements. If they uh, need it quicker in another way, we can also do IV. And the drug of choice, IV, is magnesium sulfate drug of choice to give IV to your patient so that they can get it in that way. It could also be given IM if we had to do it that direction. So we've got those ways that we need to give it. Always want to make sure the magnesium is in any sort of TPN so the patient has no nutritional intake. Uh, really all the electrolytes should be in your TPN and it should always be checked by your nurse to make sure that you have enough of all your electrolytes according to what's prescribed for them for complete nutrition. All right, so that is what we do when we have low magnesium. So what do we do when we have high magnesium? 
you probably have kidney failure. If it's that bad, we need to make sure that person gets hemodialysis. So if they do have some kidney function, another way is to give them an IV of something like normal saline. So we want to hydrate. Whenever you add water to the mix inside of your body, you're going to get uh, a decrease in your value with some uh, decrease in concentration with that dilution effect. So that's a good thing to have. Um, one of the other things to think about is if you are giving medications that do have antacids or laxatives with magnesium, we want to stop those. And then last of all, remember that we talked about how an increase in magnesium has a sedative effect on muscles. And so we're, we have to be careful with these patients because they may have problems with their heart stopping or their breathing stopping. So these patients that have high magnesium, we may have to see about jump-starting that heart. And if you remember from a previous lecture, that calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate is the drug of choice to kind of jump-start that heart and make sure that that magnesium Again, we're going to have to make sure that it gets low on our patients and that, that our heart's not affected anymore by that. But that is our drug to help jumpstart and get that. And if we have to with the lungs, we may have to go to a ventilator till the patient's able to start functioning and breathing on his own. And that is how we fix patients that have magnesium imbalances.